Our gospel for today from Matthew chapter 18. This will serve as the basis for our devotion. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God, your Heavenly Father, and from your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who commands his angels concerning your ways. What makes you worthwhile? What do you think you would put forth as the reason why you should be considered worth someone's time of day? Why you deserve a place at someone's table? Where does your mind go to when you try to justify your position within your friends, your family? Your influence. Do you think, do you think of skills that you have? Do you think of past displays of kindness? Do you think of maybe your net worth? There are a lot of ways that we try to justify ourselves, that we try to think, you know what, I, I'm worthy of being in so, so-and-so's company because of this, because I'm skilled in this way or that way, or because I'm just a fun person to be around. Jesus' disciples were having that type of discussion. They were wondering who was the greatest in the kingdom of, in the kingdom of heaven. And they asked Jesus, who is the greatest? And I'm willing to bet that they were trying to figure out who was going to be seated in these places of authority. And they probably thought that some of them were going to be in those positions on the head table at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And yet, that's not how it works. Not in God's kingdom. But that's how it works here. Even pop culture reflects that's how it works. In the 1994 movie, Angels in the Outfield, we're introduced to two foster brothers. There's Roger and there's JP. Now, Roger is told by his God that it was told by his dad, not his God. It was told by his dad that dad will take him home from the foster home when the angels win the pennant. So Roger prays, God, let the angels win the pennant. And then Roger sneaks into ball games and he sees something unique on the field. He sees guys on the field that no one else can see. Guys with wings. Angels helping out the Major League Baseball team, the Angels in the movie. And this hapless team 
is able to win because of these angels that are unseen by everyone else, but Roger sees them. And at first, no one really believes. The word gets to the manager, and he doesn't really believe it, but he's convinced to keep this kid around as a lucky charm because the players are believing it. Roger and Roger's foster brother, JP, are, are only seen as worthy to be in the presence of this team because they're good luck charms. Not because this manager simply wants to be nice to these foster kids, but they were seen as, we're, we're winning more when these kids are around. It's given my players confidence. That's not how God wants us to view anyone. That they're only worthwhile when they're doing something for us. That's why Jesus, in the middle of this argument of his disciples about who is worthy, who is greatest in the kingdom of God, he takes a little child. And you can picture Jesus just taking a little kid in his arms and then popping that little child in the middle of his disciples and saying, you know what? This is the example of worthiness. I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Jesus completely understood what it takes to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven because when they were arguing about who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus could have simply stopped it by saying, I am, of course I am. But Jesus wants to teach a lesson in humility, and Jesus is the perfect one to do so. After all, he's the one who didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he humbled himself. He took on the very nature of the servant, the eternal God of all creation, humbled himself to be conceived within the womb of the Virgin Mary, to take on our flesh and blood and himself become a child. So Jesus, in doing this, he takes the measuring rod, the measuring rod of men that his disciples are trying to use to establish some scale for greatness, and he snaps it, snaps it more than in half, but he takes the shorter side of it and that side that's as tall as a little child is, and he says, this is what you have to measure up to. And none of you are. None of you are measuring up to what is truly great in the kingdom of God. Yet you may have more stature. Yeah, in the eyes of men, you may seem more important. But you're finding your worth in what you do. Not the one who loves you. And Jesus loves the littlest. And so, for that reason, we also care for them. He's trying to get these disciples of his to understand you are to serve even those who don't seem to have any worth of their own. This little child that Jesus set among the disciples couldn't do anything for them. Had no power, had no authority. Couldn't even welcome them in their their house for a meal. And yet, Jesus is saying, this little child, because of the faith that this child has, the faith that simply looks to God and trusts, I'm going to receive what I need, is greater than the disciples who are trying to prove their worthiness. The child understands, I can't do anything to, do, to get what I need. I'm just dependent completely. That's the type of faith that God wants all of us to have, to imitate from that of a child. That's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples back to. And in so doing, he's trying to get them to understand that they are the ones who are supposed to care for even the littlest. You and I are the ones who are supposed to care for even the littlest because our God cares for the littlest among us. It shouldn't matter if the littlest among us are related to us by blood or they're not. Little children are completely dependent. 
they're at the whims of so many people around them each day. And sadly, there are so many people that break their trust. That lift hands against them that do even worse. And in so doing, cause these little ones to have less and less trust. Less and less trust in those that are supposed to care for them. And in so doing, take away their trust from the God who loves them. Jesus takes this seriously. That's why he said, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, because the little ones, no matter how young they are, God is able to create faith in them. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, that is to sin, to fall, to fall victim to, to sin, that leads them into the sin, that person should have a millstone, a large millstone tied around, the, around their neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. Now, now this sounds kind of like in a mob movie where the mob puts concrete shoes on a snitch. They put their feet in concrete and they throw them into the ocean. Jesus wants it to sound that way. The millstone he's talking about is a millstone about four to five feet tall that an animal uses to, to tread grain. Jesus says, if you're, gonna, if you're going to inflict pain Lead, to, lead little ones to sin. Take them away from the Father's love. Lead them away from the Father who loves them. That should be your fate. God loves the little ones. That's why Jesus then goes on to highlight just how important it is that we avoid sin ourselves. He goes on to that also gruesome image of cutting off a hand or a foot if it would cause us to stumble, and gouging on an eye if it would cause us to stumble. It's not that Jesus wants us to have one less hand and one less foot and one less eye. He doesn't. But he wants us to consider what leads us astray. He wants us to think through would it be better to give up those things that cause me to be led astray and enter heaven? Or to keep these sins that I, I find some perverted pleasure in and end up in hell? Because we all know it's not the hand that decides on its own to lift itself up and strike another person. It's not our feet that cause us to run into a situation where we know we're going to be led to sin. It's not our eyes that linger too long on images that lead us to lust after those who are not our God-given spouse. But it's our hearts and our minds that control them. So, in essence, chopping off a hand and chopping off a foot and gouging on an eye isn't going to lead us away from sin. But God wants us to consider what can we get out of our lives? What can we cut off from our lives so that we would not lead ourselves into sin and in so doing, not lead those who are right behind us, those, those little eyes that look at us and learn from us? Because the littlest among us are watching. They're looking to us to set an example that points them not to sin, but to the Savior from sin. We shouldn't let our feet follow after those that would lead us away from our God and our hands go to service to Satan. And our eyes look at those, those images that pervert the soul and mind. But we look to the acts of love of our Savior who didn't just set a pattern for us to follow after, but he forgives us for all the times that our body parts are used in service to that ancient dragon that God has defeated. If only the Lord would open our eyes more like he did for Elisha's servant in our Old Testament lesson to see the angels that are tending to us as well as to the littlest among us. 
the angels that are guarding our ways, that are, are also longing to look into the stories of our Savior who accomplished our sin, who paid for every last time that we have fallen victim to sin and forgives us completely and helps us now by the power of His Holy Spirit to be better examples for those little eyes that are around us. And so that we can be reminded that God does love the littlest and we also should long to be numbered among the littlest in God's kingdom. That He loves, that He sends His angels concerning At the end of our lesson for today that we're examining, we're told, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, children. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. It's this passage from which we get the popular notion that everyone has a guardian angel. But notice it doesn't talk about a singular angel. They're angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. The angels are plural there. I'm convinced from Scripture that, that you don't just, that you don't have a guardian angel. I'm convinced that God's legion of angels are constantly around us and I'm convinced by this because of what the Bible tells us, because of the Old Testament lesson that we have of Elisha's servant opening his eyes and seeing the legions of angels protecting him. Because of Psalm 91 which we sing, which confesses for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up your hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. God does send his angels to take care of the littlest among us. And the biggest among us too. You know, I, I know a man who when he was younger, he was... He was sitting shotgun in his dad in their SUV. And they were at a busy intersection. And when he was a boy, he wasn't wearing the seatbelt when he was in the car. And then he felt a hand on his shoulder and he heard a voice that he at first thought was his dad's voice telling him, put on your seatbelt. Seconds later, hit head on. If he wouldn't have been buckled in, he would have flown through that windshield, would have died or been severely injured. Instead, he just had a little bit of whiplash on his neck from the seatbelt. Afterward, he thanked his dad for telling him to put his seatbelt on. His dad said, I didn't no, you weren't wearing your seatbelt. And then the boy remembered he didn't feel the hand on the shoulder next to his dad. He felt the hand on the shoulder on the opposite side. Was it an angel? I don't know. But it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Angels do exist. Angels are real. They are ministering spirits sent to serve sent to serve God's people. And we thank God for those angels. Because in times like that, they preserve our time of grace so that we might know our God and trust in Him. Trust in Him for the life of His Son who He sent to serve us. Because we thank God that it's not just the angels that He sends to serve us. He sent His own Son the eternal Son of the Father, who is one with the Father, came to serve us. While we were still worthless to Him because we were trapped in our sins. God loves the littlest. God loves all. Regardless of how worthy we might think we are in His eyesight. We don't have to prove one way or another that we're worthy. In the movie Angels in the Outfield, Roger proved his worth for the majority of the season, right up until the game came for the Angels to play against the White Sox to win the pennant.
The angels in that movie said, we can't help you in this game. You've got you've to win it on your own. They did win. The team still thought they had the angels with them. That's where you get the scene from the movie where they're all flapping their arms. Eventually, even the manager believed that Roger did see the angels. But then Roger said, the angels aren't going to help us out anymore. And then this manager who saw these two foster kids, Roger and his foster brother JP, who needed a father, and even though they couldn't offer angelic help anymore, he came to love these boys and he welcomed them in and adopted them as his own. It's a happy ending, happy, sappy ending. But the thing is, those kids would have never had the attention of the manager if they hadn't seen the angels. You have the attention of your God. You've always had the attention of your God ever since you were even just conceived in your mother's womb. And so, since God had his eye on you, and since God has always sent his angels concerning your ways, you also show his love to even the littlest. Amen.